uh, the same time to some degree, although I had started it earlier, <clears throat> I started looking explicitly um, at uh, the anthropological debates about hunting territories as another theoretical area. And uh, I, in the end, when I finished that, I, I called that project uh, and the way it developed writing anthropological ad advocacy out of history. Um, because it was a process of discovering the advocacy in this debate. I did some uh, research. Uh, the core of the debate had been about whether hunting territories were a pre-European pre form of private property, which uh, Frank Speck and uh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Robert Louis argued, uh, starting in the 1915, or whether they were a transformed transformation of a pre-European form of egalitarian tenure and social organization, uh, which uh, Eleanor Leacock, Robert Murphy, and Julian Stewart had argued, uh, mainly from the 30s to the 1950s, and which was the prevailing view uh, in the 1980s. The wide ethnographic, sorry, a prevailing view in, up to the 60s, I should say, the research in the 1960s and 70s had undermined that view in a certain way, and both of those views, actually, because research by Adrian Tanner, by Colin Scott, by, by Paul Chate, by myself, showed hunting territories were in private property in the first place. So the debate about when they started made no sense at all. And the question then became, for me, how and why, and why has that been found so late? Why only in the 1960s do we discover these debates up to the 1950s? Um, and I went back to Speck's work, read his, all of his work, including his non-professional work, and his archive, some of it. Speck published on hunting territories after the first time he did was after meeting an Indian agent named Armand Tessier in the Lac St. John region of Quebec. And Tessier wrote an article in the newspapers arguing hunting territories were conservation and Quebec should not ban the killing of beaver by people of the Lac St. John region because those people were conserving the beaver. Um, Speck was there at the same time. They talked about it. Speck, I don't know whether Speck made a contribution to that argument. They worked together, and I cannot separate. I don't have the record to separate their contributions. But Speck went back uh, in 1912 in a semi-popular article to talk about the same thing. And to use uh, Tessier's words in some degree, and he, uh, in some places, quoted Tessier as Tessier, sometimes he used Tessier's words as Speck. Um, in 1914, Speck worked with the Tomogamy people of Northern Ontario who were experiencing dispossession and protesting the dispossession and colonization of their lands. This was um, like the people of Lac St. John. It's interesting that these were two regions and two times when local people themselves were protesting colonization, which I think historically explains the wider context of why these, some of these stories and some of the indigenous contributions to them took, uh, were, were readily available to Speck, who was a very brief visitor to each of these places. That is, I think, uh, the later chief, Gary, a more recent chief of Tamagami, Gary Potts, has suggested when Speck showed up in the middle of their conflict with the government, they understood he was a government man. He was working then for uh, the National Museum <coughs> of Canada. Uh, so they understood him as a government man, and they told him about their lands. What they also told him about, which Speck had not mentioned and Tessie had not mentioned, is that their hunting territories were their rights. And quote, uh, spe uh, Speck quotes Chief Alec Paul, the second chief of Tomogamy, in, an English speaker in English, 
uh, saying, making it clear that uh, hunting territory on land rights were, uh, were the basis of their argument. And Speck, writing in 1914, quotes Chief Paul, uh, nearly all of the elements of the hunting territory debate are, are in Chief Paul's arguments about what hunting territory are, are how their conservation, how their rights, and their analogy to farming and farmers' rights and possession of land. Um, Speck took that, and he clearly adopted it to his own, but in, in ways that showed he was having trouble keeping himself separate. Uh, he called the tr Chief Paul's text a translation. He called it notes. Chief Paul was an English speaker. Um, some of the phrasings he, uh, are echoing some of the phrasings that Tessier and Speck had done. So Speck was taking the essence of what Chief Paul was saying and the words and the ideas in significant way and putting it into, uh, he learning from it, expanding it to coincide with Chief Paul, but putting it as an argument he was also making. And he took that argument from first the publication in, a, in the Southern Workmen and Educational Journal at the Carlisle Institute that served blacks and Indians. He took that uh, argument into the American Anthropologist in 1915. So Speck's ethnographic account was organized around a prior social policy, p political policy position that was a being as asserted by Indians themselves, as well as by non-native activists, including Speck. The ethnography was structured by Speck, who took his arguments from Tamagami, set them in a different, very, a very different context of the United States colonization of Indian lands, and thereby reshaped the ethnography of Algonquian hunting territories into a debate about private property, because that's what the colonization movement was in the United States. It was dispossessing Indians by turning their lands into private property and thereby civilizing them and moving them into, into modern society. And between 1880 and 1930, 80% of Indian lands were removed from their control under the policy of, of what essentially privatizing them. So the argument had its roots not only in Speck's history of activism, but in a wider political moment of political uh, intervention in Indians' lives and the reactions to it, all of which hadn't been talked about up to that point. Um, in fact, the policy focus of Speck's ethnography was so thoroughly lost from view that the debates in the, in the succeeding years and the histories they presented even by anthropologists who insisted the uh, hunting territory was a result of colonization and colonialism and economic change, still didn't locate the debate in the actual histories of the time. And in its, put it as more an ideological dispute, referencing a very much earlier history, which is an interesting period in itself. I thought this highlighted the ways anthropologists marginalized advocacy and political engagement in their understandings of their own practice. It was a separation I thought wasn't defensible. And although I didn't express it at the time, that was the point of the article I published in the History of Anthropology series on Speck's work. The the last of what I think of as a series of works on engage, how anthropology is engaged is the much more recent work I've done uh, when, political, when anthropological practice calls itself objective. There have been numerous challenge, changes in anthropology since the, uh, in recent decades in which there's a much more critique wider critique and recognition of the problem of objectivity. But objectivity 
is still common in anthropology and it's still very common in the, in the arena of the public's anthropology enters and the politics anthropology enters. Um, so that uh, failures to separate scholarship and engaged advocacy can be declared failures of anthropology and anthropologists. In 1999, Shepard Crack published The Ecological Indian and offered a popular critique of the Native Americans as universally ecologists and environmentalists. Um, parts of his, his critiquing universalization and the, the kind of ways those symbols were manipulated by, uh, by non-Natives are quite powerful. But the core of his critique was actually a critique of indigenous people themselves. But it came, he came at it through critique first in my work. Uh, I have to say that his, his work was very well received and also enraged people. It, it created an extremely wide range of responses. It also got an extremely wide coverage in the public. So it was an, a piece of work that, uh, a work that uh, had an impact I was invited to comment on it um, by the editors of a book that was being developed on uh, uh, North American Indians and the environment in which Craig's book and the responses to it would play a central role, uh, although not the sole focus. Um, The book, in the book, critique, uh, critiques anthropologists, especially those who do policy advocacy, noting that I, like several anthropologists, have done scholarship while, quote, being a strong ad advocate of helping Native people articulate policy goals and implement change, unquote, and that I'd been doing it over 20 years and failed to separate those two interests and instead fuse them. Um, he goes on to imply that because my research publications fuse them, that explains why I've stretched my data, as he claims. It implies that I draw too strong a set of parallels between Cree knowledge and the practices of modern management, wildlife management. And he suggests I've been uncritical in reading present practices back into history. And specifically that I, uh, I've used the hunting territories and game management and conservation uh, as a basis for arguing for indigenous rights. In his view, quoting, in view, his view, history legitimates Cree authority rather than provincial and federal authority and manage, in the management of natural resources. The historical evidence is lacking for conservation until long after Europeans arrived. So, 200 pages into his book, he takes up a political argument that he didn't announce earlier, which was interesting to me because I think it's important to announce those arguments when one is merging advocacy and, and analysis. I note, however, that despite all of that critique, uh, Kretsch, Kretsch didn't actually write a chapter saying that Cree and most want to be weren't conservationists. In fact, he accepted that all Native Americans in the subarctic were conservationists, which is a little more than I thought I had the evidence to say. What he did is he challenged where they got the conservation from. My job was to write in response to it, I felt, but my job was not about me. This was through me an attack on, a, on the Native American peoples of the subarctic and beyond. And so I had to figure out a bit about how to write about it. Um, I focused on the last chapter, which was the chapter on the subarctic and the chapter where his claims were made. But I had to speak um, first to a very wide range of scholars. Historians had taken up his argument, so many with with admiration, natural scientists had, social scientists had. So I had to be, I had to write in a way that addressed a range of disciplines.
I also had to address different publics. You know, his work was widely read in, by environmental activists, university students, indigenous peoples. And, uh, and finally, I had a challenge that I didn't want to write for those who didn't, who had strong critiques of him already. His book had polarized thinking and the challenge was to write for those who thought he was on the ball. So that was the challenge I tried to take up in writing that article. Um, it leads to an article that's, that's big and rambling and strange, but that I, what I discovered as I, took, as I took a close look at what he had done was uh, quite critical, more so than I understood when I began. Using both Waswanapi Hunter's knowledge of beaver that they had shared with me and the published scientific literature, I started off examining each of the Hudson Bay Company's ways of promoting conservation in the 19th century because Crick argued that those ways were the ways Cree learned conservation from the Hudson Bay Company. Overall, it was clear that neither the Waswanapi nor the scientists would see this as a systematic and consistent set of conservation practices. Um, the HBC, but I also noticed that the Hudson Bay policy depended on the, exactly the same knowledge that hunters had shared with me at Waswanapi. That is, if you wanted to get hunters and advise them to only select certain ages and sizes of animals, or only hunt in certain seasons, you were acknowledging that you, that you knew that hunters knew how to do that. You didn't teach that, you just set the practice of buying furs and expected hunters to adjust their hunting in response. So the whole Hudson Bay policy implicitly depended on what hunters knew about hunting and what they knew was what you would need to hunt cons with conservation in mind. And they were co they were co partners with the Hudson Bay Company, as practices that did conserve beaver were developed and expanded during the 19th century. So the first thing I really learned was that these were joint efforts, and that Northern Algonquian hunters were active participants in making these policies. That the notion that it was a choice between Hudson Bay Company and white people and Hudson and indigenous people wasn't an effective way of thinking about this. Craig called what the Hudson Bay Company was doing. I should yeah, Craig called what the Hudson Bay Company was doing conservation. And that turned out to be surprising too, because he had noted that they had started this in 1820, but he also noted in other parts of his book that George Perkins, Marsh, George Perkins Marsh's 1864 work in ecology was one of the, criti the first critical early works for the development of conservation in ecology. So he hadn't really set, looked at what the Hudson Bay Company was saying, nor set what they were doing in its historical context. It turns out that, for example, knowledge of beaver reproduction and population demographics, uh, uh, I haven't found the right word there, but the biology of reproduction of beaver only came to be known in the 1950s and 60s by scientists. So he's assuming all of this existed 200 years before. And he's calling it conservation, whereas they didn't. And he's showing us that conservation is a is a term that developed starting in the mid to late 19th century. So I found the, the book problematic even in its first instance, instances. Um, he, Cree hunting territories, as he also acknowledges, were reported by Hudson Bay people in the 1740s. I, maybe I shouldn't go too much into this detail. But um, in the 1740s, it's, it's clear that Cree could have taught themselves 
hunting territories and conservation before the 1820s. What everyone agrees is that the system was disrupted during the period of intruding trap trappers and competing fur trade companies at the end of the 18th and the early 19th century. And conservation had to be strengthened again in the 19th century. Um, so the most plausible explanation is that Cree taught themselves again from memories and from people who are still doing it when they developed conservation in the 19th century. Uh, Crick also argues that religious statements made by the Cree about human-animal relations are demonstrably unrelated to Western ecology and conserving game populations. But he doesn't actually look at the biological research. A lot of it concurs with the enigmatic statements of Cree hunters. Um, an example is that Cree say that there are more beaver after you hunt them. Kretsch um, is very dismissive of this as a, as a non-reasonable uh, product influenced by, by religion and uh, traditional thought. Um, biologists have found that, that beaver, when you trap at the lodge, the female, as you trap through the winter, the female has more and more beaver as beaver are trapped. And they found that in years after the year a beaver is trapped at that lodge, beavers are trapped at that lodge, she will have higher numbers of beaver than the years before and up to the trapping. So there's a kind of compensatory mechanism here in which hunting does increase beaver numbers. And this happens in various ways with a variety of species. And Cree are talking about this in a variety of ways that if you listen to, you can start to see the patterns especially when they talked about counting placental scars on beaver uteri over time on the same lands. So there was a real dismissal, uh, again, of indigenous people without, without foundation and against uh, the evidence that does exist. Throughout these analysis, Kretsch Crack demonstrates a systematic bias by treating the knowledge and skills of northern Algonquians differently than Europeans and differently from North American knowledge and skills. Thus, his analysis about how beavers recovered, how conservation developed, is wrong. And both, both because he denies the active and leading role of Native Americans and their knowledge, and because he fails to recognize that the complex relationships between northern Algonquians and fur traders were actually the center of the process. He concludes that native northern Algonquians have no independent rights of governance, separate from that of the nation of a nation state. They do have what he calls co-management rights, by which, he, by which is most commonly meant they have uh, authority given to them by the government to participate in decisions uh, of collaborative bodies. This is erroneous politically on Crick's part because the rights are in, of indigenous people are highly contested, but that they have hunting rights is widely acknowledged in the parts of the world he's writing about. What those hunting rights are is much contested and much fought over. But in law, the fight in these areas and regions is more about what the rights are, just as the James Bay Agreement established rights in 1975. I concluded that the ecological Indian fails and disappoints also because it misleads readers about the future possibilities for North Americans and Native Americans to recognize each other's governance. I thought that presence, that co-presence, was clearly demonstrated throughout the period he was talking about. Hunting territories existed. They were not recognized by the Hudson Bay Company. 
they continue to exist as governments entered the area, and they continue to exist in the 1970s, 60s and 70s, when all the ethnography was done. So I thought his linking of policy advocacy and what he was calling objective scholarship, I hoped that they demonstrated and challenged and provoked others to think about those in more productive ways making it clear that scholarship cannot be separated from the historical, political, social, and ethnographic situations in which it occurs. And when there's a claim for objectivity, separate, it requires very careful analysis. <laughs>